Good morning or afternoon to you. Thank you for joining today's webinar. I'm Jan Reichert, Executive Director of the Antibody Society. I'm here with my colleague, Silvia Frescioli from King's College London, Cancer Antibody Discovery and Immunotherapy Group. And we will be your moderators. This is the first in a two-part webinar series on fundamentals of the immune system. The webinars are designed to inform and educate our members and the broader scientific community about topics relating to the adaptive immune receptor repertoire. The Antibody Society is very pleased to include a group that works actively in this area. They comprise the adaptive immune receptor repertoire community also called the AIR community. Our speaker today is a very active and long-standing member of the AIR community. Dr. Scott is Professor Emerita of Simon Fraser University in Canada. Today, she'll tell us all about organization of the immune system. Please note this webinar is being recorded. The agenda, as well as the slides for today's webinar can be downloaded from the materials tab in the viewer. The webinar comprises three chapters with short breaks between chapters and time at the end in which questions can be answered. So please do add any and all questions to the Q&A box in the viewer. We may not get to all the questions, but Dr. Scott has kindly offered to create a Q&A document after the webinar. When it's ready, a link to the document will be sent to all attendees. Without further ado, I now turn the show over to Dr. Scott. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. And um, thank you for attending this uh, series. Um, yeah, so I will just uh, get started right now um, on uh, chapter uh, one, which is an overview of the immune system. And let me point out uh, that um, if you uh, come across a slide uh, where a question comes up for you, Here's the, for instance, the first slide. This is just an overview of this chapter. You'll notice uh, in the bottom right-hand corner, there's a slide number. So if you could just uh, write down that slide number along with your question, um, that will probably be uh, helpful uh, if it's pertaining to a particular slide. All right, okay, so, um, uh, so uh, in giving an overview of the immune system, uh, this is how I've, broken it down uh, to uh, introduce you to what humoral versus cellular immunity is uh, and ad innate versus adaptive immune responses, the structure of the physical structure of the immune system, uh, including the cells, tissues, and compartments, and also the circulatory system and how that connects everything. And then finally, uh, something about the timing and dynamics of immune responses. And, and uh, let me point out that most of the slides have been taken from these uh, two uh, books, although the ABBAS, actually, a lot of the slides are coming from an earlier version, but still it's, it's um, cellular and molecular immunology, the eighth version instead of the ninth version, and uh, Janeway's immunobiology. Uh, there's, you can see there's a lot of additions there. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah. So uh, please put your questions in the Q&A box if you have any. And again, uh, if you can, note the slides. All right, so let's get started with humoral and cellular immunity. Um, uh, by the way, uh, this is going to be a fairly in-depth set of, of, of uh, these chapters. And so um, for some of you who have already taken immunology, uh, this will be a quick overview for you, and hopefully for the people who haven't had much immunology, uh, this will um, uh, be an introduction that, um, that's, that's helpful. Uh, some of what, what I'm trying to do here especially is to focus in on um, the cellular subsets and the uh, immune repertoires because I'm part of the air community. So I'll get kind of heavily into the genetics behind um, T cell and B cell uh, receptors. So just so you know. Okay, so humoral immunity, uh, that term is, uh, is uh, uh, based on kind of the middle ages idea of the humors 
and the humors were kind of um, uh, liquids in your body, I guess you could say. And so uh, the term humoral immunity is really talking about uh, soluble proteins that are uh, floating around in, in your blood and so forth. Whereas cell mediated immunity is uh, mediated by cells like, you, like it sounds like. And uh, what that really uh, denotes is the fact that uh, when they talk about humoral immunity, these are the antibodies that, um, for instance, can bind to extracellular microbes and viruses and things like that. And they're made by a type of lymphocyte called the B lymphocyte. And so secreted antibodies, the uh, B lymphocytes secrete antibodies that then can um, uh, uh, block infections uh, and uh, help um, phagocytic cells, for instance, remove them from the body. Okay, and cell-mediated immunity is, uh, is mediated by what we call T lymphocytes because they, they, um, they uh, develop in the thymus. And there's two types. Uh, there are helper T lymphocytes and cytotoxic uh, T lymphocytes. Now the helper lymphocytes actually work by um, uh, interacting with cells, other cells, uh, through either soluble mediators called cytokines or cell-cell interactions or both. So for instance, if you have a microbe, uh, uh, microbes that are uh, ingested by a macrophage, and this is, for instance, true for tuberculosis. Uh, uh, T, T, limb, T cells, helper T cells, uh, can recognize the uh, phagocyte, the macrophage can uh, present uh, antigens from the, from the uh, microbes on their surface to the T cells. And if the T cells recognize those, they can then uh, interact with the um, with the macrophage and activate it to, uh, uh, to increase its killing capacity and thereby uh, killing these mag phagocytosed uh, microbes. The cytotoxic T lymphocytes uh, also recognize intracellular microbes by virtue of the, uh, this is just your regular cells in your body, most of your cells, uh, through uh, presentation of, of uh, uh, parts or antigens from the microbes on the cell surface, and cytotoxic T cells actually kill cells, which is why they're called cytotoxic. Uh, and uh, so they can kill infected cells, and so they're very important in um, getting rid of infection. So between the, uh, for instance, in an infection, between the antibodies, getting this, uh, getting the uh, extracellular uh, microbes and the uh, cytotoxic T cells, uh, together they can eliminate a lot of uh, uh, microbes and of course the helper T cells activating um, uh, phagocytes and so forth. So, uh, so there's kind of two ways that an immune system, the immune system works through an innate um, set of responses and the adaptive immune response. And let me just point out that the receptors of the adaptive immune re response are going to be the um, T cell receptors and antibodies, uh, which when they're attached to a cell are called B cell receptors. So the idea is that um, the innate immune response uh, comes before and shapes what the adaptive immune response is gonna look like. So the T cell and B cell responses uh, are preceded by innate immune responses that kind of tell them what to do. And uh, so, uh, so you have in the innate immune response, I guess you could call it your epithelial barriers that can keep things from invading your body. Uh, but at the same time, you have natural antibodies and cytokines that are pre-existing and um, as well as uh, uh, phagocytes that can get activated uh, and uh, complement, for instance, um, and these other cells called NK cells and um, uh, uh, innate um, uh, lymphocyte, uh, lymphoid cells. Uh, and so all of these guys work together in the early uh, hours or the early times after, uh, let's say, the beginning of an infection. And I put a box around this cell called a dendritic cell because they link 
the innate response to the adaptive immune response. So uh, dendritic cells will um, pick up uh, uh, microbes or what we call antigens uh, and uh, actually take them to the lymphoid tissues to present them to B cells and T cells. And, uh, and to initiate their response, which is going to take uh, a, a lot longer. It usually takes about a week uh, to develop these responses. And so what will happen is B cells that have antibodies on their surface will, um, some of them out of a B cell repertoire will interact with that antigen, and then they'll divide, differentiate in antibody secreting cells, and then you'll get antibodies in the blood, whereas with the T lymphocytes, uh, they will, uh, dendritic cells will pre present antigen to them and that will teach them then to, um, uh, to uh, uh, divide and differentiate again and become effector T cells, which will then uh, either kill infected cells if there are cytotoxic T cells or working through cytokines and cell-cell interactions help other uh, immune responses, including antibody responses. Okay, and so I'm not gonna go through this list, uh, if, uh, but I, I want to just say that there are sensors or receptors that are involved in innate and adaptive immunity, and they're, uh, they have similar, similarities and differences. Uh, in the innate immune receptors, we'll recognize what we call pathogen-associated molecular patterns. So, for instance, they'll identify, they'll be uh, specific for mannose, which could be on a lot of different, on a lot of different uh, microbes, uh, clusters of mannose, because on uh, our cells, we don't have highly clustered mannose residues, uh, side chains. So, as a result, uh, they'll respond to that. Uh, in adaptive immunity, so it's, it's basically kind of classes of molecules the innate immune receptors are against, whereas in adaptive immunity, it's much more specific than that. And so, uh, so the specificity is broader for innate immune receptors, and they are the same receptors over and over again. So, uh, so the number of different molecules recognized are going to be about a thousand for the uh, for the innate um, receptors, where it's going to be, um, you know, hundreds of millions uh, or more, really, for uh, the um, adaptive immune receptors. That's, again, antibodies and T-cell receptors. <clears throat> and in the receptors, uh, you've got a lot of different ones that are intracellular, extracellular, and so forth for the um, innate immune receptors. Whereas again, it's antibodies and T cell receptors for, uh, so it's just two types of receptor basically. And um, again, um, uh, I, I think I'll, I'll just kind of stop there. But one thing I will point out down here, I guess, is that the genes encoding the innate res res uh, receptors are all encoded by your germline. So it's in all of your cells, the exact same uh, sequence. Whereas B cells and T cells actually undergo, uh, their genome undergoes semantic recombination to create uh, the different B and T cell clone uh, receptors that we then call clones because they're slightly different from each other. So you'll make huge repertoires of different uh, B cells that have different B cell receptors on their surface and huge uh, repertoires of uh, T lymphocytes that have different uh, T, uh, T cell receptors on their surface, and each B cell or T cell clone <clears throat> is committed by virtue of somatic recombination to a particular uh, receptor. And uh, also, um, both systems, for different reasons, uh, uh, are, are able to uh, recognize non-self and to either not recognize self or to, um, in, in the case of the immune system, uh, the adaptive immune system, to be to tolerate self. And the last thing that's left off of here is memory. There's weak memory or no memory uh, involved in um, innate immunity 
Uh, so uh, if, if you're presenting the same uh, thing over and over again to the immune system, it, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't expand that response and it doesn't have a strong memory of that response. It just kind of responds the same over and over again. Whereas with uh, adaptive immunity, you have a very strong memory response, which is why, for instance, when you get immunized, you typically take the vaccine twice because you need to kind of set the response and then uh, that produces memory cells when you get boosted that uh, causes a, a, a secondary response that's much stronger. All right, so the cellular locations of the uh, uh, of the um, innate immune system receptors uh, are all over, as I said before, and I won't go into it much, but they can be extracellular in the cytosol and in endosomes. And they recognize different kinds of things, RNA, DNA, and so forth. So RNA and DNA, by the way, just is, if it's in the wrong place, then note that it can be recognized. And, and that's important, especially for viral infections. Yeah, and so this is just, I'm providing you guys these lists so you can go back and look at them a little bit if you want to, but I'm not going to go uh, through them. But we'll say that there's different kinds of pattern recognition molecules. Uh, and the, in, the, the broad uh, way of thinking about it is that there are pathogen-associated molecular patterns. And then also, when cells are damaged, uh, in other words, uh, they go through um, uh, a cell death, uh, let's say from viral infection or something, then uh, you also get these damage associated molecular patterns, which again, alert the immune system that there's something going on uh, that's bad. And again, this is, I'm not going to go through this, but these are the cells of the innate immune system. And uh, so I'll just say in general, you have epithelial barriers, you have phagocytic cells that eat things. Those are macrophages and neutrophils. And by the way, macrophages are in your tissues, but they're derived from blood monocytes. Uh, you have dendritic cells, natural killer cells. And then you have these things called innate lymphoid cells that I'll talk about a, a little bit later, but they kind of work in collaboration with um, uh, T helper cells. And they actually make the same kinds of cytokines as T helper cells. Uh, and then you have lymphocytes that whose T cell receptors or B cell receptor diversity is limited and they're innate type T cells and B cells. So they actually act kind of early in the, in the uh, immune response. And then there are some other uh, cells, mast cells and basophils and eosinophils. So this is just a list for you uh, if you want to go back and, and look that up, those cells up later on. Yeah, so um, I think I've gone through this again, but um, of the innate and adaptive immune systems, therefore, are um, uh, working uh, uh, together. The innate response is going to precede the adaptive one. <clears throat> and again, the cells of the adaptive uh, and uh, of the adaptive immune response now, so we just went through the innate immune response, are going to be the B cells that when they respond to antigen, they become what are called plasma cells that then secrete antibody. And they also become memory B cells that remember uh, the response so they can respond again. The um, T cell mediated immunity, again, the helper T cells are, uh, have C this molecule called CD4 on their surface that helps them recognize uh, MHC molecules of a certain class and uh, cytotoxic T cells have CD8. So you'll, you'll hear about CD4 and CD8 T cells, and those are either gonna be helper T cells or cytotoxic T cells. Now, the B cell receptors and T cell receptors are homologous to each other. They're all based on this fold called the immunoglobulin fold. And they have two uh, areas on these molecules. Uh, B cells are made of um, a light chain and a heavy chain. And, and they're, you know, you can see that they're um, bilaterally symmetrical. <clears throat> this is the constant region that, that drives the effector function of the cell. So, when a B cell, uh, when an antibody 
binds through its what we call the variable regions here, here. That's where they bind to antigen. And similarly, you've got the same thing going on for T cells. The variable region, they're called variable regions because they're um, amino acid sequences and the DNA encoding them is highly variable. And that's allowing for the basis of a wide variety of uh, uh, antigen recognition capabilities. So there's a single heavy chain and a single uh, light chain for an, an antibody. And for the B cell, uh, for the T cell receptors, there's an alpha chain and a beta chain or a gamma chain and a delta chain. So uh, those are the different uh, kinds of uh, B and T cell receptors. Now, what do they bind to? Well, the, um, the uh, antibodies and T cell receptors, but this is just a picture of an antibody, binds to the antigen binding site or um, is uh, called a peritope and it, it binds to a thing called an epitope. So that's just the contact region between the two things. And, uh, and you know, the and binding energy is driven by, you know, hydrogen bonds, Van der Waals interactions, hydrophobic interactions, salt bridges, and polar interactions, like all molecular interactions. So, and they're non-covalent bonds there. <clears throat> and the same kind of recognition is going to happen uh, between a, an epitope and the peritope. Uh, for the T cells. Uh, for the antibodies, I just wanted to quickly tell you there are different classes of antibodies and they all have their little binding sites here. You can see that, but their uh, constant regions are different and that allows them to have different functions. IgE is for allergy, IgGs are what's in your blood mostly. IgA is secreted in your, so they coat your mucosal surfaces. And IgMs are part of your initial antibody response, but you can see they all have the same uh, single component structure, you know, IgD and so forth. Uh, but they can be held together with these little joining chains. So the thing is an IgM is an antibody that's made early in the antibody response. And uh, they're multivalent, so they can bind a lot of antigen, even though they might not have very good uh, binding affinity, whereas <clears throat> IgEs and so forth um, need higher binding affinity to really uh, 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 stick to uh, an antigen. Now, T cells recognize a different antigen in the context of an MHC. That's a major histocompatibility complex molecules. And the MHC is actually a genetic locus where uh, uh, these molecules are um, uh, uh, encoded. So major histocompatibility molecules in people, they're called HLA, and in mice, they're called um, uh, something else. So anyway, so we'll just call it MHC to make it easy. And so the antigen will get broken down, and uh, MHC will actually, uh, inside the cell, antigen will be taken up by the cell, broken down, and then um, little fragments of those protein antigens. So um, T cells only recognize protein fragments. They don't recognize anything other than protein. And so these peptides can bind to the MHC molecule and that allows the MHC molecules to fold up properly. And then they'll be presented on the surface, <coughs> the surface of the cell. Cytotoxic T cells, class uh, CD8 cells recognize class one MHC. And helper T cells recognize class 2 MHC. And actually, the CD8 molecule will recognize, well, the, the T cell receptor will bind to the surface here, whereas the CD8 molecule will kind of feel around to the lower part of the molecule and go, oh, yeah, that's class 1 MHC. Let's, let's do this. And the same thing will happen for uh, class 2 MHC for a, a, a helper T cell. The T cell receptor will bind to the surface and uh, the CD4 will double check and make sure it's the right class of MHC and then go, let's do this. And they'll signal that way. So again, cytotoxic T cells will recognize MHC on the surface of uh, a cell and through CD8 binding to the MHC molecule and T cell receptor binding, 
it will then, uh, the T cell will then uh, realize that it's supposed to kill that cell. Now that is a, a T cell that's been educated against that antigen. So again, this T cell receptor is, has higher affinity because that particular peptide is sitting in the MHC molecule. Um, and that's why it recognizes it. It's because of that particular peptide. And so the epitope recognized by the T cell receptor is peptide uh, in the context of MHC. So it's binding both to the MHC molecule and to the peptide. And uh, meanwhile, uh, uh, the CD4 T cells can do two different things. One, they can bind to antigen that is bound to um, a T cell and, um, uh, sorry, bound to class two MHC. And again, it can uh, interact with that cell by giving uh, cytokines to it and having other interactions that, uh, that uh, uh, activate the macrophage, for instance, to um, uh, up, upregulate its digestive processes. Um, uh, meanwhile, helper T cells, uh, another type of, there's like seven different subsets of helper T cells. The um, uh, T follicular helper T cells. So uh, this is kind of interesting. A B cell, just imagine it's going to have antibody in its surface and it binds to antigen. It will take antigen into its body, process it, and take those little peptides, and some peptides will be able to bind to class 2 MHC. That'll get displayed on the surface, and that will allow the T cell to recognize it and then activate the B cell. And so it's actually the helper T cell and the B cell together that cause the B cell to have a good, strong antibody response plus memory B cell formation. Okay, so what is the basic structure of the immune system? Well, you've got a lot of different, in your blood, a lot of different um, cell types that are all part of either the innate immune response or the, um, or the adaptive immune response. So here's your lymphocytes here. And these all come, all I'm gonna say here is from a single precursor, single uh, hematopoietic precursor uh, in your bone marrow. So all these guys are coming out of your bone marrow. Um, yeah, and so that's what's circulating in your blood, and um, and the uh, the uh, the so that's one part of the structure of or the, these circulating cells, and then uh, they're circulating through your cardiovascular system, and uh, and through your lymphatic system. So I wanted to show you a picture of a lymphatic system. So again, the um, hematopoietic stem cells are in your bone marrow. And we also have, so that's called your primary lymphoid tissues. And uh, the thymus is also a primary lymphoid tissue because T cells uh, become, um, I guess you call them pre-T cells, uh, will actually migrate out of the bone marrow into the thymus and do all of their development in the thymus. So uh, and then they'll escape that and start circulating in the, in the body. And so uh, what you have here are um, your lymphoid uh, uh, vessels, which drain all of your tissues. So uh, in your, your heart is pushing uh, blood out of your system. And then that blood is coming back in through, is going out through your arterial system. Uh, and the arteries get smaller to become arterioles. Then they get a little smaller and become uh, uh, capillaries. And actually the capillaries are leaking fluid all the time, which is feeding your cells, right? And then that, that fluid is then picked up by your lymphatics that fluid is picked up and re-enters your um, right heart. Uh, and so uh, your, your right heart is basically pumping and sucking all of that excess fluid back into your heart. Now, your arteries are turning into, like I said, arterioles, uh, 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 capillaries, and then venules and then veins. So, uh, so the, um, the, 
the return blood is also going back into your heart as well. So there's a, um, a thing called the thoracic duct that it, in different people it enters in different points, but it enters the big veins that are going back into your heart. So all of that fluid coming out of your tissues plus your venous blood go into your right heart. And as a result, that means that fluid is bathing your tissues and constantly uh, you know, bathing your tissues uh, basically to feed your cells. And at the same time, oxygen exchange is happening at the capillary level and so forth. So um, your lymphatics, your lymphoid, your secondary lymphoid tissues are going to be your spleen uh, that filters your blood. And also uh, these little uh, uh, lymph, lymph uh, nodes, which are all over uh, 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 that are filtering uh, your uh, lymphatic fluid as it returns to your heart. And the secondary lymphoid tissues is where your T cells and B cells go to find antigen. And they know how to home to those tissues. They're constantly checking them out. And so here's just another picture uh, of the... Um, and, and this is this explanation I just gave you, if you want to go back and read it, because it's kind of complicated. But the point is, is that, um, that all of these lymphatics, again, are going to return to your, uh, your right heart uh, through, um, through, this, uh, through your lymphatic vessels. And so it's, it's kind of like a mirror image of your vascular system, your lymphatic system. Now, I also, also want to show you a lymph node to tell you two different things. I'm going to call, uh, so the, here's these afferent lymphatics. So that's lymph that's flowing back to your um, right heart is coming in through the lymph, afferent lymphatics. And then it's going to kind of percolate through this tissue. And then it's going to leave going out the efferent lymphatic toward the heart antigen from your periphery is going to enter through this as well as dendritic cells. So let me go back and say that, let's say you get an infection in your hand, you're going to have uh, uh, the uh, antigens, let's say it's the microbes or something, you're going to have those antigens coming to the draining lymph node as well as dendritic cells will pick up that stuff then innate immune response that it has, its innate receptors will go, oh my God, bad. I'm going to eat this thing and I'm going to take it to this draining lymph node here. And I am going to present this as antigen to the uh, uh, B cells and T cells that are circulating through. Well, how do the B cells and T cells get in that tissue? Well, the way they come in is actually through the circulatory system. So here's, here's an artery, red. And here's a vein, blue. And what happens is, is the B cells and T cells are in the blood. They come through. And this is a B cell uh, follicle. So the, these are follicles that B cells like to be in. And this is other tissue called the paracortex. Uh, so B cells are in the cortex or the outer part where there are follicles. And T cells are in the paracortex. Um, and... So what's happening is that the T cells and B cells recognize the, this, this region of the, um, of the lymphatics, uh, uh, sorry, of the uh, venule, which is a small vein. The vein gets bigger down here. Uh, and and the, the cells lining your entire uh, vascular system, lymphatics and blood vessels are called endothelial cells. They're the inside lining. And they're slightly different here. They're called high endothelial cells because they're just taller than regular endothelial cells and they have markers on them that B cells recognize and they will, and T cells, and they will leave and enter this tissue. The B cells will go into the cortical area. The T cells will go in the paracortical area. And when they get activated by antigen, because remember dendritic cells have come in here and antigen has come in here, and so the B cells and T cells will then react with the antigen. If they recognize it and they get the right signals, they'll divide, differentiate, and then want to go and do stuff. So they will leave the in, through the efferent lymphatic, go to the right heart, and then 
travel to wherever they need to go in the body. So that's the cool thing about these lymph nodes. Uh, so lymph nodes concentrate antigen and provide a place for T cells and B cells to see concentrated antigen in a highly, uh, uh, a highly orchestrated uh, system uh, where, where the, uh, the immune responses are initiated. So dendritic cells are gonna initiate these immune responses for the T cells and also to some extent for the B cells. But within the follicles, these uh, B cell follicles are another kind of cell and they're not related to a regular dendritic cell called follicular dendritic cells. And they actually present antigen to the B cells. Okay, and I'm not gonna go through this a whole lot, but the spleen is another organ that is a lymphoid organ and the blue in here is kind of, uh, sorry, the white in here is where you've got T cells and B cells that are also, um, <clears throat> it's the white pulp of the spleen uh, where also antigen is getting concentrated and uh, you can push immune responses there. Another uh, type of tissue is the mucosal lymphoid tissue. So this is like the inside of your nose, all the, it's kind of the outside of your inside. So it's your, you know, the inside of your throat, the inside of your esophagus, the inside of your stomach, all of that. Now they're coated with what are called epithelial cells. Your skin is a kind of epithelial cell too, uh, the outside of your skin. And these epithelial cells are uh, your mucosa, so they're covered with mucus, right? Anything that's wet, just think of it that way. And um, and uh, so you've got, a, you've got the uh, epithelium and then the underlying, it's called the lamina propria, and that together uh, is gonna be kind of like your, um, your, uh, 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 your mucous membranes, I guess you could say, your mu mucosal lymphoid tissues. And again, uh, antigen is going to uh, enter, like just remember, if, let's, if this is your gut, you're gonna have a huge amount of bacteria in your gut. And so this is the barrier where if, if it gets breached by the bacteria, then, uh, then you can have an immune response that's uh, pretty, uh, uh, can be very inflammatory. But normally, this is all kind of kept uh, quiet by uh, uh, what we call uh, T cells that are going to be regulatory T cells that uh, allow your system to recognize the antigen that's out there but not respond to it. So it's tolerance. And uh, I, this is a horrible picture, but what I wanted to show you is this is a large intestine and you can see all these little mesenteric lymph nodes draining it. So you have uh, uh, in, in your uh, intestines then, you've got in, on the inside, you've got bacteria and all that. And uh, you've got these, uh, you're absorbing food from your gut and that's going uh, through these, <clears throat> it's going um, into your uh, circulatory system, but at the same time you have your draining lymphatics that are also um, pushing immune responses um, uh, through, your, uh, through your gut. Okay, so the general timing and dynamics then of the immune response is that, <clears throat> that you're gonna have an innate immune response. So, Let's say you have a pathogen that's trying to enter your body um, and maybe you've got an anatomical barrier like your skin and uh, that can prevent a lot of infection. But if that fails, then you've got pre-existing innate immunity, such as pre-existing uh, what we call natural antibodies. We've got the complement system. There's lots of different pre-existing uh, innate immune uh, cells there, uh, responses there. And uh, if that doesn't work, if those effectors don't uh, get rid of the infection agent, then you have an early induced response. So these are phagocytic cells and that kind of thing, uh, eating the bacteria and so forth. And if that doesn't happen, so that's uh, the, the pathogen associated molecular pattern receptors and so forth working. And if that fails, due to the dendritic cells and, and antigen getting transported to the lymphoid organs, you're gonna then kick off an immune response. That's an adaptive immune response that takes longer. And again, this is just saying again, you know, the, what I showed you before. 
Um, and again, so what's going to happen then is if you get a little infection, you're going to initiate an immune response. And those effector cells are then going to circulate to the body. They're going to go back to the heart, circulate to the body and provide their effector function. And for instance, they're going to come back down to this infection that's peripheral and they're going to attack that infection. So the point is you've got two things happening here. You've got the cells getting recognizing the immune, uh, the uh, antigens and all that locally. So you have a local infection, concentration of antigen in the lymph nodes, T cells and B cells, naive ones, naive lymphocytes recognizing this. They become activated. They figure out what they're supposed to become. They divide, they differentiate, they leave go back to the right heart and then go into the circulation where they return and knock out that infection. Okay, so I've just gone through that and I'm, this is me explaining it again if you wanna go back and read that sometime. And now I'm, I'm kind of done here uh, and I think we could take a short break uh, and I could answer maybe one or two questions. If anybody has any. So, uh, uh, I, Sylvia, are you going to, are there any questions there for me to answer? Yes. Hello. So, Hi. would you mind commenting on the potential differences, if any, in germinal center reactions in SLO, like tonsils versus mucosa lymph tissues? Thank you. Um, I think that we're going to get to that later. So, okay. this was just an introduction. And so I'm going to leave that for now, if you don't mind. The germinal center reactions versus extra follicular responses, I actually will, believe it or not, I will be getting to it. <laughs> okay. Good. Okay. So next that. question. Yeah, I'll, I'll take the next one. Uh, how do antigen presenting cells choose which fragments to present among the pool of randomly digested antigens? Oh, thank you. And so those would be proteins. And um, I will get to that later too, but I'm glad you care. Uh, again, this is an overview. So I'm going to break this down some more for you all. So just hang on tight if you're interested. Uh, otherwise, you can kind of go ahead to the other slides if you want. Yeah. Okay. So uh, what's the difference in lymphocyte development in the bone marrow and thymus, if any? We collect bone marrow and not thymus. Oh, okay, bone. so in the bone marrow, uh, B cells will develop in the bone marrow and T cells will develop in the thymus. And again, I will be going through with that with you as well. So I'm going to just have you hold on there. I wanted you to see the big picture here. Um, okay. Yeah, there's one quick question that is pretty general. So I think okay. uh, you can address this one. It's can B cells recognize anything else than proteins, for example, DNA, RNA or lipids? They can recognize it all. And I will be talking about antibody specificity versus T cell uh, receptor specificity uh, when I get to talking about the structure of antibodies. And so you guys are so great. I'm so glad you asked all these questions. So why don't we take a quick break? Uh, and uh, in, in, in five minutes, we'll, uh, we'll get back to the next set of slides. Okay, well, good. Those were great questions that were asked and I hope I can answer some of them now for you. And again, in this chapter, we're going to be talking about the genetic basis of B cell and T cell receptor diversification. Because remember, there are hundreds of millions of different receptors in these repertoires, uh, how they get positively and negatively selected uh, because your immune system only wants certain, uh, certain uh, recognition uh, capabilities and uh, what the B and T cell subsets are because there are a bunch of them <laughs> and some of them are more innate and some of them are more quote adaptive. Um, and then also we'll be talking about adaptive immune uh, receptor repertoires and what they are, and a little bit about how they're currently assessed. But I will tell you that when it comes to number two, there is an excellent set of webinars on the um, Antibody Society uh, website uh, by Victor Grief uh, that it goes into much more detail 
uh, in terms of looking at adaptive immune receptor repertoires. But here you'll understand the genetics behind all that. Okay. So uh, the, the, the idea of selection by um, antigen was uh, postulated in the 1950s and 60s. So this is like the central idea behind how the adaptive immune system works. Uh, there were competing ideas, but this one actually turned out to be the one that was mostly true. And I uh, won a uh, Nobel Prize for uh, Sir, Sir McFarlane Burnett and others. So the idea is that it's clonal selection. This is the important part, by antigen, by antigen. So his, the ideas behind uh, clonal selection is that every lymphocyte has a different type of receptor with a unique specificity to it. Uh, and that the interaction between a foreign molecule, which is what we mean by antigen, an antigen is something that generates an antibody response. That's how it was first defined because the first thing that people understood were antibodies, not t they didn't even know T cells existed. So uh, the foreign molecule and a lymphocyte receptor capable of binding that molecule with high affinity leads to lymphocyte activation and differentiation. Differentiated effector cells then uh, derived from those activated lymphocytes will uh, bear the receptors identical to uh, what the antigen bound, which is not completely true, but it's mostly true. And uh, then uh, lymphocytes that bind to self get uh, negatively selected. And lymphocytes to begin with, when you're talking about your, your, your original repertoire, lymphocytes bearing receptors that weakly bind to self are positively selected. So we'll be talking about that, but then the, uh, the effector cells are gonna be selected later on by antigen. But when you're developing your, uh, your, uh, your uh, repertoire, your T cell and B cell repertoires, they're gonna, those, all those cells are gonna undergo negative and positive selection. And that's what this slide is about. So you, again, you have a lymphocyte precursor in your bone marrow and, uh, and the T cell ones will travel to the, to the uh, thymus. They're gonna rearrange their, uh, their uh, genes, either their T cell receptor genes or their uh, B cell receptor genes <clears throat> because in the germline, uh, so in your germline uh, genome, the uh, the um, those those the, the 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 genes encoding the T cell receptors and the B cell receptors are actually broken down into gene segments, which I'll get to later. Anyway, and they rearrange, and that creates different antibodies or T cell receptors on the surface. Those cells become mature. Once, once they have undergone, undergone positive and negative selection, and once they become mature, they can then get selected by antigen to then, uh, to then respond. And that will only be a subset. It's not everything. It's just the ones who have receptors that actually bind to the antigen are then going to be selected. So that's how clonal selection works. By antigen works, it's just simple binding. Uh, affinity between the receptor and something on the antigen. If it, <coughs> if it's a, if it's a, if the antigen is a peptide in the context of MHC, well, that would be a T cell receptor. Uh, otherwise, it can be just about anything, including a drug, uh, for an antigen, um, for an antibody. And these are showing, you know, antibodies on B cells. Okay, so that's pretty much how it works, and again, those lymphocytes, if they get activated, if they're B cells, they will become plasma cells that instead of having antibody on their surface, they will actually secrete that specificity uh, by a single um, mRNA uh, change. Okay, so what is the genetic basis of that? And so here we're gonna get into um, the sequences of the variable regions. And people started out sequencing um, antibody what they're called plasma cytomas that they would induce in mice uh, that would cause a single and B, um, plasma cell 
to uh, turn into cancer and secrete a whole lot of a monoclonal antibody. <clears throat> and so in the early days of protein sequencing, uh, headed by folks like Lee Hood and uh, uh, Cabot and Wu and stuff, uh, they would do the sequencing and Cabot and Wu then took about 100 antibodies uh, sequences for the heavy chain and the light chain. Remember, there's a light chain and a heavy chain, the big long guy. Uh, and this is the uh, N-terminal region, so the V region. And what they found is that they compared their sequences, they saw a lot of variability in three different places. And they named those complementarity determining regions, CDRs. And they figured this these regions of the uh, molecule must have the most contact with antigen because they're the most variable. In other words, they're they're different, most different between antibody sequences. Same for the light chain. Now, I'm just going to tell you in advance that the v, there's a, going to be a V gene, a D gene segment, and a J gene segment encoded in the germline. And there's a whole lot of these guys. There's a whole lot. There's like 50 or so of these guys in people. There's about 25 of these guys in people. There's six of these guys in people. These so there's 50 V genes, 23 or so D genes, and six J genes. And one of each of those is going to get picked out and recombined together to form uh, an antibody, a uh, heavy chain variable region. So this guy. And all of this leading up to uh, it should be saying CDR, not hypervariable, but CDR3 uh, is encoded by the, a V gene. A D segment is coding this middle part, plus you're going to see that there's variation where everything's stitched together here. And the J gene is encoding this blue part. And so this is the framework region, the CDR1, framework 2, CDR2, framework 3, CDR3, and framework 4. Same thing goes for the light chain. The only difference is, is that light chains are only encoded by two gene segments, a V gene and a J gene. And I will also point out that the joint between the two is going to be at CDR3 of the light chain. It's the most variable region of the light chain. So all of this variability is germline encoded all the way up to here and same here. Okay, just so you know. That's why there are a lot of V genes. Okay, so why, what does that look like in terms of protein structure? Well, it looks like this. So this is an immunoglobulin fold, and <clears throat> the CDRs are all clustered together. So they actually form a little surface here that is highly uh, variable, especially the CDR3, because it's a VDJ or DJ joining and where the joining happens there's a bunch of variability i'm going to show you later on so it's forming the paratope or the antibody combining site is what it's called in an antibody uh, the general term for it is paratope but the paratope actually means what binds to a particular antigen so all of this surface is called the antibody combining site but only the part of the antibody combining site that actually interacts with whatever the antigen is, is gonna be called the paratope because the paratope and the epitope are mirror images of each other, right? They're, they're the contact regions. Okay, so as I said, you've got a lot of diversity. You've got about, here it says 45, this is in people. Uh, and you have one heavy chain locus called the immunoglobulin locus Ig. And then you have for you've got two different loci for the light chains, kappa and lambda. And then you also have for the T cell receptors, you've got two different kinds, unfortunately, alpha and beta, or gamma and delta. Now, gamma and delta are in a more of an innate type T cell, and alpha and beta are in more of your classical T cell. So most people just talk about alpha and beta. Anyway, so here's all the diversification that can happen. And you'll get uh, uh, special joining diversification N regions and P regions stuff I'll get to uh, in the heavy chain and the light chain, VD, DJ, 
Uh, and actually there is some in region. Anyway, I'm not gonna get into that. So, and here's your joining segments and, and here's your potential diversity because of what we call imprecise joining. Here's the actual loci. Well, not actual, but you know, here's a picture of the loci. And what you see is that for every, so these are the multiple V genes. And then further on down the line, these are the D segments. There's about 23 of them. And further down the line, here's J. And then you have uh, all of the regions that are encoding the different constant regions. Because remember, there's IgM, there's IgD, there's four different kinds of IgGs. So here's gamma 3, gamma 1, and so forth, IgA, and so forth. Uh, and here's the kappa uh, locus. Again, you've got V genes and you've got J genes, and then you've got a constant region. And you've, for lambda, you've got V genes and you've got different constant regions. Don't ask me why, because I don't know. But um, I think it's, well, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Anyway, in front of every one of these genes is a promoter. So what happens is you're basically going to get a J during B cell development, the B cell goes, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm, on, I'm, I'm, I'm a pre-B cell. I'm finally going to rearrange. I'm going to take one of my Js and I'm going to link it up to one of these Ds. And then the DJ is going to pick out a V gene with a promoter. And that promoter is going to get activated because now it's going to be near an enhancer right here. And because C mu is just downstream, that this whole thing is going to get uh, transcribed. So you're going to have transcription uh, and a VDJ here in the middle part gets cut out. Anyway, as a result, that's going to give you your antibody. And similarly, you're going to have a J, V, and there's a promoter here. I forgot to put P's in here. Um, uh, a J, V recombination or a lambda, you know, kappa or lambda J, V recombination to make the light chain. So what happens in the stages of B cell development in the bone marrow then is that you have a stem cell, then you have a common lymphoid precursor, that's what CLP stands for, then you have a precursor of a progenitor, and when you get to that stage, basically, you finally become a pro-B cell, and you'll turn on these genes that will for, allow for DJ and then VDJ joining, and uh, that's going to be a recombinase that's making it come together. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And also, uh, you're going to have uh, TDT adding nucleotides on the ends of the joints to variegate these joining regions even more. So the point is that you're going to make a good v, uh, heavy chain gene. And that is going to go up on the surface of the cell along with a surrogate light chain. It's a fake light chain. But now the cell knows that it's got a good heavy chain. It's going to divide a whole bunch, make a whole lot of copies of itself. And then uh, it's going to go back and, uh, and, and uh, go through. Uh, so there's the proliferation. It's going to go through VJ joining and become, now it's going to get rid of the surrogate light chain. And that's how you get your second and now it's an immature B cell that's going to have to go through positive and negative selection. And then it'll finally be a mature B cell and it'll go out into the, uh, to the periphery. Now, I wanted to go into a little bit of detail about this VDJ joining stuff. And this is, they're just showing a uh, light chain rearrangement. Because again, this is for the, uh, and, uh, the uh, uh, repertoire people out there. So the point is, is that you've got a V gene and it's got this little guy here and this little guy here. These two little guys together are called recombination single se signal sequences. They don't code for anything, but they allow the genes to get aligned. They allow the genes to get aligned so the rags can cut in, come in and do a cut here and do a cut here that are then bringing V and J together. And so as a result, you cut out a loop, and that's just sitting there like a little episome in the cell, minding its own business, and it gets ligated. And then also what happens is the ligation happens 
at either end, because remember this is DNA, so it's got two strands, creating these hairpins. And here's the crazy weird thing that happens. By the way, this whole system was stolen by retroviruses God knows how long ago. So this is where the imprecise joining happens here. So basically, then these guys are gonna get clipped in an imprecise way. They don't, they get clipped and I'll show you in the next picture. And as a result then, you can add what we call N and P nucleotides on either end of the joining, which is this guy that's pink right here, and then it all gets ligated together. So this is what it looks like. You get the, you get the two strands, so this is where the V gene is, and over here is where the J gene is, and it got clipped, and then it gets ligated, okay? And then if this guy gets clipped here, then these residues are gonna flip out, see, like that. And if this guy gets clipped here, it's gonna flip out like that. And then it's gonna get filled in. Those are called palindromic, because it's a palindrome. TCGA is a palindrome. Those are palindromic residues that can get added on, right? So those get filled in and those are called p-nucleotides. But with uh, something called TDT, uh, that's another nucleotide that is non-templated or N-nucleotides can get added on at random. So you can have P-nucleotides and N-nucleotides or this whole thing can get chewed back by exonucleases and you, and you can actually chew back into the gene. So this is important for people when they're looking at the uh, CDR3 of the light chain. This is the CDR3 of the night chain, but typically you wouldn't see N nucleotides there because TDT isn't very active when you're rearranging your, your uh, light chains, but it is pretty active when you're rearranging your heavy chain genes. So, uh, so the point is the P nucleotides can be deduced because they're at the end of the germline gene. We, we have the sequences for all the germline genes. So it's at the end of this and you see a palindrome, you know it's a P nucleotide. Anything else, it's not templated, it's not templated on the germline gene, therefore it's an end nucleotide. And that's how people figure it out. So again, here's a picture of the heavy chain constant regions. They're all, uh, this is one exon, this is an exon, this is an exon, this is an exon. Then you have little exons here, transmembrane and cytoplasmic for a B cell receptor. That gets replaced by a, a secretory component or a secretory piece uh, when uh, in a plasma cell for secreting the antibody. And this is a light chain. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't have a transmembrane, anything. But, and here's the three CDRs encoded on the germline gene, but not the, and, and this, this, this is wrong because it, it shouldn't show the J, but um, that's the CDR3 and the CDR3. So, and the same thing goes for T cell receptors for the alpha chain is like a light chain. It just has VJ and the beta chain is just like a heavy chain, it's VDJ. And again, the T cell receptor is never secreted. So it's always got a transmembrane region. So that's how that works. Now antibodies, getting to the structure, antibodies bind to the surface of just about anything. This is binding uh, three epitopes. These are three epitopes on the surface of uh, uh, hen egg white lysozyme. And you can see this is one surface bound by high hell 10, another one by high hell 5, and another one by high hell 7, for instance. And it's just showing you the contact region. So there's the epitope. That's what the peritope, uh, the footprint of the peritope. Okay, so the point is, think about antibodies as binding uh, the surface of things. This could easily be a uh, polysaccharide on the surface of a bacterial cell or whatever, but it's always going to be pretty much sitting on the surface of something. Whereas T cell epitopes are protein fragments taken from within. Why? Because the reason why these peptides get on, these two fragments here uh, can get on uh, to MHC is because they have what we call anchor residues that when they get chopped into peptide fragments, allows them to bind with pretty high affinity 
to the MHC molecule. Those are anchor residues, anchor residues. So here's a picture of an MHC molecule. And you can see sticking down here is an anchor residue. Uh, there are other residues that are, so this is the anchor residues of the peptide are sticking down and, and, and interacting with, and they also interact with the ends, the carboxy termini and stuff in the end termini. So this is class one MHC. It's a short peptide, nine to 11 residues long or so. And the anchor residues are particular side chains, interactions that are allowing this peptide to stick into the uh, MHC molecule. And this whole thing uh, in the original Nature article said it looks like a hot dog bun. And this looks like a hot dog inside the hot dog bun. So that's a good way to picture it in your mind. And meanwhile, these side chains here are sticking up. And so the T cell re receptor is going to be recognizing all of both these uh, helices and uh, parts of this peptide. Okay, so these are anchor residues for, you know, particular uh, MHC molecules. So the point is that uh, that different, that the, it's just a few anchor residues that are anchoring the peptide into the MHC molecule and other residues are going to be sticking out that are going to provide the specificity for uh, T cell recognition. And here's a picture. <clears throat> okay, so this is a side view. This yellow thing is the peptide. Remember, it's got anchor residues. It's sitting inside an MHC molecule. And uh, here's the bottom of the MHC molecule that's going to be, this is, uh, this is um, a class one MHC molecule. So CD8 is going to recognize this guy down here, but you can't see that right now. And here are the CDRs of the alpha chain and the beta chain. And you'll see CDR3 of the alpha chain and the beta chain are sitting right on top of that peptide. So if you pull the T cell receptor off and turn this toward you, turn this guy to face you, here's the peptide down here. And you can see the alpha chain and the beta chain CDRs, you can see what they're all contacting. So that's why it's peptide in the, in the um, peptide is being recognized in the context of MHC. So what you need is right in these sticking up residues that are being contacted, you need high affinity interactions just by a couple of side chains and that's gonna give you enough of an affinity boost like 10 fold, 20 fold, that now it's gonna cause that T cell receptor to signal. Okay, so this is the TCR loci and again, you've got your V's, B genes, your J genes, and some other J's and V's, so you can come off of either one. It's just complicated. It's, I don't know why, but it is. So, but the point is that for the beta locus, there's D's. There's not a lot of D's, uh, but there's, uh, but there's, so you get, again, J, D joining, followed by joining to a V gene, and then you have a good beta chain and then you're gonna um, later on make a good alpha chain by doing J V recombination, and it's the same for the delta locus. Uh, so it's uh, gamma delta, uh, and delta has D regions, and gamma uh, gamma has just V J. So again, gamma, alpha, and light chains are all similar. Beta. Delta and uh, heavy chains are all similar. Okay, and so this is the exact same thing going along for uh, for T cell maturation in the thymus. So starts out stem cell in the bone marrow, and then uh, a pre T cell or whatever it is moves into the thymus, and they go through a recombination. So here's your VDJ. Then they have a fake. Uh, they have a fake, they've got a good beta chain and a fake alpha chain, and then they recombine again, they get a good alpha chain, and then they go through selection. Okay, so what is selection? So basically, you've got your uh, positive and negative selection happening here. And uh, so uh, you have to 
call out anything that's going to bind to you because otherwise you'd just be a walking autoimmune disease. So, uh, so you get, you've got your lymphoid precursors, you've got your immature lymphocytes, and then they have to go through um, uh, positive and negative selection. So even with the B cells, they actually bind very, very weakly to self, uh, and depending on which B cell subset you're talking about, and, uh, in or and they signal, and that allows them to survive. But then if they bind too tightly to self, they get destroyed. So you end up with mature B cells that uh, then go into the periphery. And there, they, they're kept alive by kind of very, very weak self-signaling. And um, if they see anything that they bind tightly to, they'll die. If they're not getting any kind of positive uh, signal, they'll die. And, um, and uh, they can also be suppressed by uh, T regulatory cells. And so that was, is peripheral tolerance. Central tolerance is uh, getting uh, knocked out at the point of your development. So again, we, we've got a, a bunch of different places where we have quote negative selection happening. Uh, so again, we have negative selection in the bone marrow and, uh, and, uh, and, and if you have, well, this is, it's complicated, but you can have, uh, uh, uh an energy happening with, uh, low, uh, avidity, uh, and low binding, but, uh, it's usually these are soluble proteins. So I, I, that, I know that's going to be confusing to you, but anyway. But let's talk about T cells because they're very cool and they're better understood. So you've got a, a post-capillary venule, you've got cells coming into the thymus and they actually go through uh, maturation uh, uh, in particular places in the thymus and they're going to recombine their genes and all that. And then the point is, is that they're going to be seeing and getting selected on MHC because uh, your T cell repertoire, it's never seen MHC before. And yet you want to train. So this is really important. You want to train your, um, your uh, T cell repertoire to recognize your MHC, not somebody else's, but your MHC molecules. And so what happens is those T cells bind to what are called thymic cortical epithelial cells that have class one or class two MHC. And when the T cell receptor from a T cell is naive and it doesn't know anything, it's not, it's not CD4, it's not CD8, it's actually double positive, they call it. It's double positive, it has CD4 and CD8. It will bind and CD4 and CD8, if, if, it, if the T cell receptor binds to the surface of the MHC molecule, CD4 and CD8 will feel underneath that molecule. And depending on whether it's class one MHC, if it's class one MHC, CD8 continues to bind and CD4 gets downregulated and that cell becomes a cytotoxic T cell. So it's a CD8 T cell. If, it's, if the T cell receptor binds to an MHC molecule that's CD4, then, and, and, and those could be uh, tight binding or weak binding, it doesn't matter, it just binds to a certain point. And the CD4 uh, recognizes the uh, MHC molecule because it's class two MHC. Then CD8 gets downregulated and that T cell becomes a CD4. So now it becomes a single positive cell, CD4, CD8. And then uh, further along in the, um, uh, in the, uh, in, not in the cortex, but in the medulla, you get medullary epithelial cells and macrophages and other guys and dendritic cells and so forth that you get negative selection on. And that means that if the MH, if the, if the, if the T cell receptor binds too tightly to the MHC molecule and it's signaling a whole lot, then it, it gets deleted. So now what you wind up with is a T cell receptor a uh, repertoire that only recognizes class one or class two MHC of yours. 
and it also binds weakly. And so that allows then for a peptide that's foreign to have residue sticking up there that somebody in the re repertoire is going to see that, see those side chains sticking up and go, oh, I'm binding better now. And now you get that tenfold jump in affinity, and that allows the thing to signal. Okay, so, uh, so again, uh, going back to your T cell and B cell lineages, then thinking about the bone marrow, you've got a hematopoietic stem cell that's going to have a lymphoid progenitor that is either going to go to the thymus and become T cells. Uh, and there's different kinds of, these are all guys related to each other. So the very most innate T cells are called innate lymphoid cells, ILCs. They don't have T cell receptors. That includes some NK cells, natural killer cells that you may have heard of. And also these thing called NK T cells that actually do have a T cell receptor on them. You also have the gamma delta T cells, which are another innate type of T cell that actually they get, uh, they get planted into your periphery when you're developing as a baby, essentially. And a lot of these ILCs do too. And then you've got your classic alpha beta T cells that we're all used to. And they can either be CD8 cytotoxic T cells that bind to class one MHC, or they can be CD4 helper cells that bind to class two MHC and they can differentiate into a bunch of different kinds of T cells based on the kinds of uh, cytokines that they uh, secrete. So for instance, T follicular helper cells, they go to the follicle and they help antibody responses. T follicular regulatory cells will suppress antibody responses. T regulatory cells will uh, uh, secrete uh, cytokines that uh, knock back uh, Th1, Th2, or Th17, and, and we'll get to these T-cell subsets in a minute. Meanwhile, for your B-cells, you also have more innate-like and more uh, adaptive-like B-cells. We have B1 B-cells that circulate. Uh, we have uh, what are called marginal zone B-cells that uh, circulate in uh, people but not in mice. And they're more innate-like. They have a more limited repertoire. And, uh, and then we have your follicular B cells so um, that go to the follicle and uh, you know, can get activated by T cells and so forth. So here, for instance, is the B cell, uh, B cells starting with your uh, adaptive immune B cells that, are, uh, that uh, follow a T cell response. So, uh, the uh, follicular B cells, they go to the follicle, they get activated in the follicle of the B cell, and they get helped. They'll actually go out and look for it. Once they get activated by antigen, they'll go out and look for a T cell and find one uh, where a T cell is, I'll show you in a minute, that get activated too. And these guys work together to form these T-dependent isotype switched high affinity antibodies with long-lived plasma cells. And so they can switch to IgG, IgA, IgE, whatever from IgM. They originally start out as IgM. Marginal zone B cells uh, are, um, and these guys can be against anything, but they need protein. Why? Because you, you need protein to get a T cell response. So there's got to be some protein in there, even though the, the antibody doesn't necessarily have to bind to protein. It can bind a carbohydrate that's connected to protein. Okay. So the uh, marginal zone B cells are in the marginal zone around the follicle. That's why they're called marginal zone B cells. And they're really good at binding the polysaccharides and lipids. They form part of your T independent immune responses. They can class switch a little bit. They uh, are usually short lived uh, immune, response, immune responses. And they're really great. They kind of act in a more innate way. They're extra follicular. They, you don't see these cells in the follicle. And uh, they produce antibodies of intermediate affinity, IgMs and IgGs and IgAs, uh, but mostly IgMs. So, and then in your mucosal tissues, you also will have, uh, in your peritoneal cavity, you'll have these 
B1 B cells that are kind of like a, a marginal zone B cell. And again, they can run T independent responses. And they're really great at making natural antibodies. Uh, so uh, you don't have a very good antibody response unless you've got bacteria in your gut. And that's probably just, uh, you know, uh, against PAMP like molecules that are on, on, on microbes. Okay, so those are your three kinds of B cells. And your T cells are uh, different subsets. Again, again, you've got your cytotoxic T cells that recognize class two MHC, uh, sorry, class one MHC, which is on all of your cells, like any, any of your cells that can, except for some kinds of neurons and I think um, uh, germinal uh, sperm cells. So class one MHC is not on those because you don't want your females attacking the sperm cells. Anyway, men's birth cells. Anyway, so uh, so that's class one MHC, and uh, then you have class two MHC. All these guys. So uh, Th1 responses uh, help activate macrophages that then uh, that have ingested bacteria and viruses and stuff. Uh, Th2 responses run by different cytokines. Uh, they can help push antibody B cell responses. Both of these can, and they, they're going to force the B cells to class switch to particular classes, in this case, for instance, IgE. So Th2 responses include allergy, but also against parasites associated with your mucosa. And then Th17 are going against uh, neutrophils that are really like some kind of bacteria and fungi. And they have, uh, again, different kinds of uh, cytokines. And then you have your T follicular helper cells and your T regulatory T cells that can knock back all of these kinds of responses. Okay, so uh, finally, uh, then we have memory T cells. So this is like me, I'm in here somewhere getting close to the 70s. And you can see in young, uh, you've got a lot of naive cells, but they're starting to fall uh, during your uh, lifetime. And that's because the thymus involutes and becomes just a bunch of kind of lipid fat stuff in there. And, and uh, the, it's, it, you can't make a whole lot more uh, T cells. So that goes down with aging. Your memory uh, T cells expand that are circulating through your body and your naive cell populations drop. And uh, this kind of is you know, an aged immune system. This is a young immune system. And so you can actually kind of see, uh, see that, and the way you live kind of affects that. So the final thing I wanna say has to do with the adaptive immune receptor repertoire. So again, an error is gonna be the collection of B cell receptors or T cell receptors in a population of lymphocytes. And the reason why I say that is because you can sort the cells out and crack them open and sequence their rearranged heavy chain and light chain genes or uh, heavy chain or just the heavy chain uh, genes or TCR beta or TCR delta or whatever genes uh, in the expressed recombined genes. So those functional genes that are encoding these receptors. And the beauty of it is that if you could like look at, let's say, I don't know, 10,000 or a million B cell receptors in a population, you may see some that are um, have a, at a much higher frequency. Well, that's telling you that that B cell clone expanded in response to you know some kind of antigen. And uh, so um, you can also look at plasma cells and see what their uh, expanded uh, uh, B cell receptors look like. And, and now that we have, it's easier to actually clone, uh, to sequence the light chain and the heavy chain together. Uh, there are certain ways of doing that. And when you do that, uh, then you can actually make a monoclonal antibody if you want to have the gene made, uh, you know, synthetically. And, uh, you know, boom, Bob's your uncle. And you can do the same with T cell receptors. So the point is, is that uh, people will look for these as expanded clones in particular populations. So high throughput, massive parallel uh, cDNA sequencing, people call it RNA-seq, 
or single cell RNA sequencing, uh, can uh, these technologies can allow you to assess uh, uh, populations. And so, again, you can sort out a population of, let's say, B cells. You can use antigen, label it, and sort out antigen-specific B cells and uh, plasma cells uh, that are in the blood are usually early to re early responders uh, to vaccination or whatever. And you can just PCR up just that VDJ region, that's all you need really, or the VJ region, and then you can do massive parallel sequencing, which then you better know some bioinformatics to, uh, to start looking at clones. So that's pretty much the overview. If you want more than that, go see Victor's uh, thing. And we'll just take another, I, I think I'll just answer questions and we'll blow off the five minute break because we're gonna be done in a half hour. And I'm gonna try to get you as far through chapter three as possible. Are there any questions right now about any of this? Actually quite a few. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I can go with, how common is to have an antibody and TCR with the same CDR sequences? Uh, I think it's um, uh, it's pretty un infrequent because of the uh, D region. So uh, at least with the heavy chain. So and with the light chain, uh, you have more of your uh, J and V going into the CDR3. So I would say almost never. <laughs> Next question. Can CDR sequences be used to predict, whoops, we just switched around, uh, predict, let me start over. Can CDR sequences be used to predict epitope sequences, assuming you have an unknown antibody and want to define its target protein? Well, I think people have gotten further along with the T cell receptors doing that. Uh, from the CDR3 uh, combination, there's, for instance, a, a thing called glyph. I think you can do it somewhat, but it's just that the uh, the beast, what you saw is CDR3 is hitting that peptide, right? And, and not only that, but it's only certain kind of side chain interactions that are going to give you good affinity, like a hydrogen bond, uh, probably not, but a salt bridge, yeah, a hydrophobic interaction, yeah. So you can actually kind of figure out in that peptide, if you know what residues are sticking up, uh, what the interactions are going to be to some degree. And so uh, I think people are further along with uh, predicting uh, the sequence of uh, antigen from T cells. It's harder to show it because you have to take soluble MHC and get a peptide into it, label it, and, and light up your T cell receptors that way, which is kind of a pain because there's so much variation of MHC. Uh, but that's what, what you can uh, do. And with antibodies, it's a little bit more tricky, uh, but I think people are making progress with that. Okay, so uh, what is cross-presentation and what is the basic difference between class one and class two and AC molecules? Okay, well, the basic difference, I think I've already told you, so just go back in the slides because I don't have too much time here. Uh, but class one molecules uh, are, you know, they're, they're uh, encoded in the MHC region of your genome. And uh, I can't remember what chromosome that is. But you have, uh, for instance, you've got three different, on each chromosome, you've got three different class one and, uh, molecules and uh, you've got it's a, just a single chain uh, and your class two molecules i think you should just look this up and read about it but you have two chains an alpha chain and a beta chain for class two mhc which is easy because it's two you know a uh, roman numeral two so it's easy to remember anyway uh and um so those mhc molecules are different from each other and the way they process antigen, which I'm not about to go into because I don't have time, uh, is different. So I'll just to briefly tell you that class two MHC, the way they get their peptides is by the cell called an antigen presenting cell. Uh, that could be a macrophage, a B cell, or a, uh, or a um, macrophage, B cell, oh, or dendritic cell. 
Uh, they phagocyte toe stuff, they break it down and they stick it on their class 2 MHC. And so that's an endoscope processing thing. Whereas for uh, uh, class 1 MHC, which I will get into in my next talk, uh, you're going to see that processing happens intracellularly. So that's where you have a viral infection or a, you know, a mycobacterium or whatever inside and your cell, and it's going to be class 1 MHC, MHC, and that's happening in a completely different way because that's cytoplasmic processing, essentially. Um, yeah. Uh, go, all right, so one, one last question, and then we really should get to the third chapter. Okay. What is the value in knowing the germline BCR TCR sequence in addition to the BCR TCR sequence of the clone? Okay, well, so I didn't get to this because uh, I will later, but for instance, there's two reasons. First of all, uh, you can see where you have your germline gene tells you where you're getting N region and P nucleotide additions, uh, which is helpful if you're trying to understand your uh, T cell receptor, your B cell receptor. And then what I haven't told you, and it's just gonna make your life even crazier, but after B cells are selected by antigen, particularly, not always, but particularly, if they get T cell help and there's a germinal center reaction, your, immune, your, your B cells will start mutating the VDJ region uh, of the functional uh, recombined uh, light chain and heavy chain uh, V regions. And as a result, uh, you can have pretty heavy mutation. And if you want to make a lineage out of that, uh, you need to understand the germline genes. Well, thank you very much for taking questions at this point. Uh, but we should move on to chapter three. Okay. And uh, just let me tell you that if I don't get through part three, we can always go back to the rest of it. And on June 15th, when I'm doing my second whatever uh, lecture, which I hope I don't have to hope I can get through this. But if I don't, I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to rush it so much that I'm making it like less comprehensible than I'm already making it. <laughs> OK, so clonal responses of B cells and T cells. So I'm going to go through signaling, activation, proliferation, differentiation of T cells and of B cells. And I may just get through the T cell part of it and then I'll just ask answer questions and then uh, we'll just see how far we get. So, and again, I'm just going to tell you guys up front, I'm not really great at understanding signaling. So this is going to be stuff that's really 10 years old and you should go talk to a signaling genius if you want to know more. Okay. Uh, but the point is, is that uh, we'll, we'll be talking about signaling and all that through the, these uh, adaptive immune receptors and also how co-stimulation is absolutely necessary. Otherwise, if you don't have co-stimulation, uh, you can create tolerance, essentially. Okay, so uh, so uh, I'm going to start with T cell responses because they're the coolest when it comes to this stuff. So uh, so again, remember that you get a dendritic cell that's peripheral. It picks up antigen and it goes to a, the lymph node and it presents antigen through its uh, class 1 and class 2 uh, MHC. So whenever you think dendritic cell, think initial... Uh, T cell response. So that means naive T cells are recognizing. So this is now in the paracortex of the lymph node, essentially. CD8 T cells are going to recognize class 1 MHC, CD4, 2. So what happens is you've got all these naive cells that are just walking in there from your blood and filling up these MHC molecules and going, ah, no, 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 I'm not signaling, I'm not signaling, and they're blowing it off. And then all of a sudden, somebody has the right T cell receptor to interact with that peptide, and they're getting an affinity boost because of those side chains I told you about. And they're like, whoa, I'm signaling, cool. And so then they will uh, start to, um, they will upregulate the, IL, uh, the interleukin-2 receptor, which is uh, for a growth hormone that they will also secrete, and that will make them uh, get activated further and proliferate. IL-2 is a like a growth factor for T cells. And then they will also, due to other stuff happening, 
other kind of uh, uh, cytokines that they're getting from the antigen presenting cells, ILCs, and other innate type cells in the lymphoid tissue, they will then proliferate and differentiate into two kinds of general kinds of cells, effector cells. Effector cells will go out into the periphery uh, and home to, let's say, that infection or whatever, uh, or they will be memory CD4 cells that will continue to um, go to what they call central. They can also be called central effector cells. So there's kind of gradations of memory, but they go back and they're constantly, so not only can this APC activate a naive cell, they can also activate a memory cell that has traveled back to the, uh, to the uh, uh, lymphoid tissue looking for antigen. And that's why when you get boosted, these memory cells can go back and go through this whole thing again and um, expand even further. And, and memory cells respond much faster than naive cells do. Naive cells respond kind of slowly. These guys will be in a day or two, boom, they respond. So the point is, is that this picture is a little bit false because in the background, you should also be seeing central CD4 and CD8, central effector memory cells uh, going in here and uh, getting reactivated if they see the antigen again. Okay, killing of infect. So the same thing happens with these, uh, you'll get effector cells and memory cells in the periphery. Okay, um, what else? Activation, okay. So uh, again, so what's gonna happen is that naive T cells are gonna come in through the arterial system, walk out of those high endothelial cells, get activated by a dendritic cell. And then what they can do uh, is uh, uh, they can then uh, become effector T cells and go out of the efferent lymphatic and go to the site of infection. They can also, if they're a CD4 a T follicular help, helper cell, they will travel toward the B cell follicle following a chemo, chemokines made by the, the what are called follicular dendritic cells. And they'll just kind of wait. And B cells, they get activated by antigen held by the follicular dendritic cells. If they get activated, they will come out and interact with that T cell and they will then go back in together and form a germinal center reaction. And when they're ready, they will leave through the uh, efferent lymphatics to uh, go do whatever they're supposed to be doing, memory B cells or whatever, uh, and memory T cells and so forth. Okay, so the thing is, is that dendritic cells and these other innate immune cells, <clears throat> if they're secreting different kinds of uh, cytokines, and I've, eosinophils, basophils, and uh, uh, what are these MCs? I thought these are macrophages, I think so. No, they're not. Mast cells, okay, eosinophils, basophils. And anyway, they will then force the T cell to become a Th2 cell. So that, again, the T cell gets activated, it's naive, it doesn't know what it wants to do. But if you have these cytokines around, then it will force it to become a Th2 17 cell that will secrete C TH, uh, IL-17 and IL-22, or it'll become a TH2 cell or a TH1 cell and so forth, or a, or a, a TFH cell. So all this up here is happening in the lymph node, right? In the lymph node, when the naive T cell is first being trained to become it, it already knows that it's a CD4 cell or a CD8 cell, but if it's a CD4 cell, it doesn't know what it's supposed to become. It's called a null cell, and now it's gonna become something else. And this is an induced uh, T regulatory cell. Okay, is that good? Does everybody get that? I, you can't answer me, so. <laughs> now, the thing I wanna point out is that not only are dendritic cells helping along with this, but you also have these what are called innate lymphocyte lymph, lymphoid cells that are similar to the, um, the T cell subsets in terms of the um, 
cytokines that they secrete that are going to force those T cells and also call out the same kind of cell for a type 1 immune response versus type 2 versus type 3. So the, uh, that's going to affect the T cells in their differentiation, but it's also helping to push the, um, the uh, effector cells that the T cells are going to be uh, training, essentially calling out. So, uh, which are going to be macrophages, eosinophils, mast cells, and basophils for type 2, and then neutrophils for type 3. And these are going to be Th17 T cells, Th2, and Th1. So, this is all, these guys are all working together. More innate cells are working with the uh, T cells. So, how are they getting, how is that signaling even working? And the answer is, well, You've got the T cell receptor binding to the MHC molecule. This is on an antigen presenting cell. Uh, so uh, in this case, and so that's why it's CD4 and class two MHC. And so you've got T cell receptor binding. And remember it recognizes this class two MHC molecule weakly, but now with the peptide, it's bind binding tighter. And you've got CD4 also helping with your signaling. So that's activating the cell. Then you need other stuff. If it was just this happening and not this other stuff happening over here, then the, the T cell would become energic. So it wants to know that this is an APC in this case that's got B7 on it that's going to cause CD28 to also do some things pushing survival. And the APC is also going to be secreting those cytokines, telling the T cell how to differentiate. Um, that now, if this is a T help, if this is a T cell, it may upregulate its CD40 ligand that will provide a signal back to the APC, whether that's a dendritic cell, a B cell, or a macrophage, and it will stimulate it back to do whatever uh, it it needs to do, become a, an activated macrophage, an activated B cell, or an um, uh, a, um, uh, what did I say, dendritic cell, B cell, macrophage. So, so this is kind of then the uh, flow, whether it's an antibody on the surface of a B cell or a T cell receptor, uh, where you've got kind of the flow of uh, changes that result in transcription of things such as cytoskeletal changes, adhesion molecules, changing metabolism of the cell because it's getting activated and turning on things like cytokine genes and so forth. So I'm not going to go through all this, but this is just these complicated signaling pathways. And what I do want to uh, kind of just bring up is that again, uh, the CD4 or CD8 molecule is helping to phosphorylate these little yellow things called ITIMs sorry, ITAMs. So these are uh, immune receptor uh, activating molecules. So they get, they get phosphorylated by lick and fin. And then this kind of master regulator guy, Zap70, can hang on to that and, and get the whole thing going where you have um, uh, NFAT being, you know, transcription factor, NF-kappa-B, and AP1 transcription factors all working together to push the transcription going. But you also need to have CD28 stimulation, and all this can get inhibited by CTLA4, which also can bind to these B7 molecules on, um, on antigen presenting cells. So this is, for instance, would be uh, uh, a, um, uh, a uh, the, the, the three signals again, the T cell receptor, the secondary signaling, and then uh, uh, then uh, then also uh, the uh, you don't see it, but there's also cytokines affecting this cell, telling it what to differentiate into. Now there's inhibitory signaling as well that I just mentioned, and those have what we call ITIMs on them, which are immune uh, immune receptor. Um, uh, uh, inhibitory signaling molecules, and in this case, 
It's, it's the SHIP and uh, SHP and SHIP phosphatases that are going to dephosphorylate everything that got phosphorylated in that signaling pathway. It's going to knock it back by virtue of getting rid of this, the phosphorylation that, for instance, uh, ZAP70 has set up. Okay, and these are some more uh, uh, inhibitory molecules on B cells. You've got FC gamma R2B that has an ITIM. Uh, and uh, for instance, PD1, I'm sure you've heard of, ITIMs and so forth. Uh, and these are the two phosphatases. One is doing the, phos the uh, phosphorylated tyrosine, uh, knocking off the, phos uh, the phosphate groups from that. Or you can have inositol phosphate uh, that's phosphorylated in the inner leaflet of the uh, cell membrane getting knocked back that's going to also knock back the clustering and signaling going on uh, uh, at that site. And by the way, antibodies against PD1 uh, PD will block PDL1 uh, uh, from uh, binding to PD1, and therefore it, it can't signal that way. That's a therapeutic drug. Okay, so uh, in terms of the humoral response then, uh, we have uh, um, uh, naive B cells, again, that always have IgM and IgD on their surface, and they're going to meet with antigen in the, uh, in the follicle, that, and the antigen is actually going to be uh, presented by... Um, uh, the follicular dendritic cell that's inside the follicle. And, uh, and that is going to then, um, with uh, helper cells and other uh, and, and antigen stimulation, anyway, it's going to become an activated B cell. It will proliferate and it will become, uh, uh, you, you, you'll originally make short lived plasma cells that secrete IgM. And you'll also have IgG B cells. Uh, you'll have class switching. So you'll have IgG B cells that can uh, form um, uh, plasma cells that can uh, secrete IgG and, uh, or IgA or IgE, uh, depending on what it's told to do. But you will also have this thing called affinity maturation. So B cells will pick up mutations in just the region that encodes the light and heavy chain variable regions. And so that will diversify those B cells that have been activated by antigen. And then what will happen is uh, you will actually have selection happening in the germinal center for the higher affinity B cells. And that means the low affinity guys drop out and only the high affinity clones, many of which that have antibody uh, that have somatic mutations to make those antibodies bind a little better, uh, they, will, uh, they will be selected. And that's how you get these high affinity uh, antibody responses, but they're driven by T follicular helper cells because it's happening in a journal center reaction. So the way B cells see antigen is uh, that they can, antigen can come in uh, of different sizes, either through these weird little conduits that go straight into the follicle and, uh, and follicular dendritic cells pick it up, or you can have these kind of macrophages that are uh, just on the surface of the tissue of the, lymph, of the lymph node. They'll scuttle on over and transfer the antigen of these guys, or dendritic cells can do that as well. So follicular dendritic cells get loaded with antigen and when B cells come out of the circulation, they are attracted to the follicle and they start filling these guys up for um, antigen. And where a B cell actually binds, it gets activated and so forth. Uh, and this is just a little more about follicular dendritic cells. So um, I think, because I've got five minutes left, I will stop there. Uh, and uh, take any further questions. Uh, Jan? Hello. Okay, good. Hi. Yeah. So I can start. Um, does the total number of B cells and T cells increase after 
all this proliferation throughout our lives? If not, how come? So we, we it, it's weird, like people don't really understand it, I don't think very well, but it's like in your body, you've got a niche. And so what happens if that niche gets filled up as you get older, like it's filled to a certain point with um, uh, more naive cells when you're younger, but that quote niche gets filled up with more memory cells, memory uh, T cells and B cells and so forth as you get older. And in fact, like with your last few years of life where your immune system isn't functioning too well, you can have an overabundance of certain types of memory cells like um, uh, effector, CD8 effector uh, cells against uh, uh, herpes viruses like um, a cytomegalovirus, and uh, and so that can actually crowd out <laughs> your your functional immune response to some degree, which is kind of bad. So um, I hope that answers your question. Next question. Oh, actually, before I ask that next question, I want to assure anybody who may need to scamper off right at one o'clock that I will let you know that when the on-demand version is ready, we will continue ans answering questions, but Dr. Scott will supply a Q&A document that will be posted on the website. So no worries if you do have to run off, you will not miss any content because we will run after you and hunt you down and make sure you have it. Next question. How is self-antigen expressed in the bone marrow to check for BCR self-reactivity? Uh, well, you've just got antigens uh, there. So, uh, so uh, anything that's binding in your uh, bone, uh, in the uh, mature B cells, but then I didn't tell you this part because it's more complicated. The, uh, what are going to become your classical follicular B cells and your marginal zone B cells? They actually move to your uh, spleen and they, uh, as quote, transitional cells. So they're not fully, they're not fully mature yet. They mature uh, in your lymphoid, secondary lymphoid tissues, and they're actually seeing a lot of antigen there too. Uh, and so, uh, so as a result, because they've circulated and all this other stuff, they can get deleted or become energic at that point as well. So there's a lot of self antigen around, right? Okay, I'm done with that question. Okay, so uh, do we have time for the last question? Sure. Yes, just yeah. keep on going. How does the self antigen binding work? Is there expression of every single cell effort of express somewhere? Uh, it's the same general mechanism of binding, but uh, there's a lot of different variations on it depending on there are multiple levels of uh, uh, central tolerance that's happening in the bone marrow and the uh, beginning of the secondary lymphoid tissue for B cells and in the thymus for T cells versus peripheral tolerance that's happening a million different ways uh, in, in, the, uh, in the periphery. So that's in the lymphoid organs and elsewhere. So um, yeah, so I can't answer that question because it's too complicated to answer in a simple way. Next question. Can we say that MHC1 and TCR recognize the same peptide but bind to different epitopes? Follow uh, well, the anchor residues are really not called epitopes, but yes, that's what's happening. The, and the and the secondary question is: Will their binding affinity differ significantly? So the idea of TCRT can also apply to MHCT. Uh, that I I I'm not enough of a T cell expert to tell you, but I can just tell you that you've got to have a significant jump in affinity in order to activate the cells. And uh, there's all kinds of work that's done on T cells low affinity versus higher affinity uh, interactions and how T cells respond to that. There's a whole literature on that. So I'm going to stay away from that. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so is the process of differentiating from naive lymphocyte precursor pool to mature lymphocytes only occurring during development childhood or does it occur throughout life? Sorry, I didn't understand the first part of what you were saying there. Could you say it again? So, is the process of differentiating from naive lymphocyte precursor pool to mature lymphocytes only occurring during development uh, childhood or does it occur? No, this is happening. Life? Yeah, it's happening all the time. As long as you're putting out naive T cells, they're maturing in the periphery, you know, they're uh, recognizing things and, and, and uh, becoming, uh, you know, different T cell subsets in, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the periphery. So that's happening all the time. But as you get old, you have fewer naive cells, <clears throat> therefore you've got more memory cells and they're kind of getting hogging whatever antigen is there. So the, T the naive cells, they get a chance, but if you already have a memory response, that's gonna come in and proliferate more and expand more and so forth. <clears throat> Plus you don't have very good thymus anymore. So the T cell, the naive compartment is is continually expanding as well, you know, because it has to. Okay. Yeah. Next question. Do CD8 T cells need CD28 co-stimulation for activation of cytotoxicity? Uh, they need it to begin with. So again, when they're naive CD8 cells, they react with the dendritic cell the exact same way that a CD4 cell does, but then afterwards they do not need it. All they need is class one MHC uh, uh, having the right peptide in it and they can kill that cell. And they can do it in about 20 minutes time. Okay. Um, how are self-reactive lymphocytes identified and eliminated when exposed to a limited variety of self antigens in the bone marrow. How does the body know they're self reactive? This okay, is related well, well, to slide seven. Uh, the um, B cells, uh, where they see self reactivity, they can actually rearrange new light chain genes, trying to, it's called receptor editing. And they'll do that uh, to uh, change their specificity so they don't die. So I think they bind to a lot of things in the bone marrow. When it comes to T cells, there's actually a transcription factor in some of those uh, epithelial cells, or I think it's in the epithelial cells. It might be, yeah, it's in the medullary epithelial cells and it's called AIR. It's different, it's A-I-R, not A-I-R-R. -R. And what it does is that it just at random turns on all these genes in the genome, one, you know, here and there uh, to upregulate and process onto, onto MHC, class one and class two, uh, all these different things that might not be in the thymus. And as a result, it expands. If you get rid of air, you have auto, you have much more autoimmune disease. Like, so they know that air is important for some of the negative selection that happens in the thymus. I mean, that I can answer you. Yeah. But I think B cells are more plastic. And I think when they get out in the periphery, there's a lot of different ways to knock back a B cell's reactivity. Yeah. Next question, we have uh, about half a dozen, just to give you some idea of where we are. <laughs> the next question, you're very popular, Jamie. You did an excellent job explaining all of that, but it was a lot of content. And yeah. uh, so it's great to see these, these questions. How does complement recognize pathogens promiscuously versus the selectivity uh, that antibodies have? Well, okay, so uh, if an IgM binds to something, because remember that's got like six, five or six, depending on if it has a J chain or not, five or six, uh, it's huge. And so if IgM binds to something, it in itself, because it's bound and it looks like a crab or a spider, it's weird. So if an IgM binds multivalently, let's say to the surface of a bacterial cell, polysaccharide, uh, then complement, that'll activate complement. Complement can also be activated uh, a bunch of other different ways. And when complement gets activated, it creates this stuff called C3B, B is in boy. 
And that has a reactive group that if it's anywhere near uh, a carbohydrate or a protein, it will bind to it co covalently. And so uh, uh, B cells uh, get, can get activated. And I was just about to show that here in this picture. Uh, so uh, C3, uh, that should say B. Um, <laughs> Anyway, C3B is bound, uh, but I, get, I think they're saying it gets cleaved down, and then it's recognized by this complement receptor. So that can actually push, help to stimulate an antibody response. So complement is very good at, as, as a co-stimulator for B cell responses. But complement also uh, can, um, uh, there's, there's a whole lectin pathway for complement activation that I'm not going to get into. And what lectins are is uh, uh, molecules that look a lot like an IgM, and they bind to carbohydrates, uh, again, like cell wall polysaccharide, and they activate complement kind of in the same way that IgM does. So there's, uh, and there's other things called pentraxins and stuff like that. So if you look at that list of um, soluble, uh, innate uh, immune uh, molecules uh, back in you know chapter one you'll see as some of those guys a bunch of them activate complement on their own by just recognizing um, and then you also have the alternative pathway that uh, basically normal cells have uh, on their surface uh, different things that inactivate complement so that's why your cells don't typically don't get blown up by complement but bacterial cells don't. So as a result, C3B is getting activated all the time and it can bind to the surface of a microbe because it doesn't have anything to prevent it from binding. And as a result, you can build up complement complexes on the microbe that, that actually lice it. And so uh, that's another uh, pathway. So I hope you're tired of hearing about complement now. <laughs> Good. Um, this question is about antibodies against conformational epitopes. So how can they be generated from short linear MHC peptides? They're not. They're not. <laughs> no, the answer is they're not. B yeah. cells, uh, antibody, B cells ha uh, have uh, antibody on their surface, and that antibody binds to the surface of things. So just think surface it has to bind to the surface. And that's why conformational epitopes on proteins are typically what, uh, what antibodies are against. They're not against like a loop that's sticking out or something that you can kind of recreate with the peptide. Uh, that happens somewhat, but typically that peptide is only binding to a subfraction of what the antibody originally, uh, what the antibody would normally bind to. So. When people go, oh, I've got a peptide and it looks just like the epitope. No, it's just binding to that antibody. It's cross-reacting with it. But its footprint is probably a lot different than the footprint that an antibody would have against the original protein. So, uh, and peptides, uh, you may be conflating peptides uh, for MHC uh, that are in the same uh, protein and that would be in, uh, in, an, in an antigen presenting cell or uh, that, uh, that is taking up the antigen, breaking it down and uh, putting that same protein antigen, but different parts of it onto its class two MHC molecule. So the point is, is that to have a pro, if you have a protein antigen and you're making a very good antibody response against it, it's driven by T cells, there has to be T cell epitopes in the protein and B cell epitopes. B cells have to bind to the surface of it, and it also has to be able to pro get processed. You know, there's multiple copies of this protein, right? It's an antigen. You got a lot of it in your body. And so it, 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 that, that, that also, that protein gets uh, uh, processed by antigen-presenting cells uh, that's uh, then showing, uh, including the B cells, that are presenting uh, the antigen on class 2 MHC. So just, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Okay, last, last couple of questions. We're uh, closing in on the end here. Uh, this attendee first says, thank you for a great session. 
Would you mind commenting on the potential differences, if any, in germinal center reactions in SLO like tonsils versus mucosal lymphoid tissues? Yeah, so uh, that's a big uh, answer. That's uh, okay. So you've got your draining lymph nodes that will drain most of your body, but then you have mucosal associated lymphoid tissues. And underlying that are, uh, are, um, uh, are uh, Peyer's patches that have uh, germinal centers. And you'll also have just kind of patches, germinal centers just kind of sitting around in those lymphoid follicles. So if you were to like yank out one of my tonsils and cut it in half, you'd see on the, because that's mucosal lymphoid tissue, right? You'll see underneath it like a whole bunch of germinal centers with a microscope because uh, you get so much cell division in there that it squishes everything and uh, it's pretty, it squishes things so much that they're really detectable. Any anyway, with, with uh, just normal dyes, uh, H&E stains. Anyway, so the point is, is that uh, the um, mucosa then, uh, remember that you're, you're, you've got draining uh, so uh, you also have your draining uh, lymphoid tissue. So you've got your Peyer's patches that are great for instigating an antibody response and your B cells that are going to secrete IgA, your plasma cells, they actually go to the crypts in, uh, for instance, your um, gut uh, the, of your, you know, micro, you've got villi and stuff. And so it'll go to those crypts and just sit there and secrete antibody into, there's a whole pathway for getting it out onto the mucous membrane, mucus layer that's, uh, that's flowing past everything. So uh, there are just called poly-IG receptors that will secrete the uh, di dimeric antibody. Anyway, so what happens then is that there's two different ways that this can uh, happen, and I think I actually talk about this later on, is that uh, your um, anti antigens in your gut it can get over on, you know, if they get into your, if they get into your tissue, uh, a Peyer's patches uh, can uh, activate responses. You can get them right there. Or the draining lymph nodes, the antigen will go into the draining lymph node and T cells can get activated in that draining lymph node and they will home back. They will do homing back to the, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, uh, lamina propria where they will set up a response. So you've got two different ways to make, uh, pathways to making an immune response uh, in the mucosal uh, tissues. Just remember, you've always got those draining lymph nodes on your side. So um, how do APC choose which fragments to present among the pool of randomly digested antigens? Okay, so that has to do with those anchor residues. Anchor residues, they, they have to have, You've got to have these anchor residues sitting in particular pockets in the MHC molecules. And just remember, there's probably about, you know, 300 different variations on, on class 1A. There's class 1A, B, and C molecules. And uh, so class 1A, there's about 300 or 400 different ones. So that's our, our, it's our MHC that makes it so you can't get a transplant from me or reject it unless we have the same MHC background or that's why they have to have good matches for kidneys and all that other stuff, kidney uh, transplantation. So, uh, so the point is, is that the subset of anchor residues varies for every MHC molecule. So the six that you're born with, you know, three on one chromosome and three on another one have different peptide specificities uh, when it comes to anchor residues. So it's pretty much kind of a random thing unless you're a virus and you do all kinds of things trying to mutate yourself so that you won't be able to bind anybody's MHC. But because there's so much MHC variation, that's not possible. That's why we have so many different variations on MHC is to get around viruses that try to escape. Anyway, so I hope that is a good answer. Yes. Uh, these last couple of questions, 
uh, were asked before, um, just after the first chapter, so you may have answered them, but just for completeness, we'll go through them. The question is, what is the difference in lymphocyte development in the bone marrow and thymus, if any? And the, they remark that uh, we collect bone marrow, not thymus, in mice. Yeah, so I didn't hear the first part of your, you broke up. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, sure. Uh, we'll, the starting again. What is the difference in lymphocyte development in the bone marrow and thymus, if any? In the mouse? Uh, they, they, they're in parenthesis. This person put, we collect bone marrow and not thymus in mouse. Yeah, so what you're going to see is developing B cells and not developing T cells. And so what people will do, for instance, is that they'll take B cells and they've got particular markers on them when they have uh, rearranged their heavy chain but not their light chain, so they haven't gone through any selection, and they'll go, okay, uh, how often do we use this germline gene? Because the placement of the germline genes and the stuff around it on the chromosome dictates how often a particular germline gene is used. And so they'll just sequence those guys. Well, you can't do that with T cells. You'd have to yank out the thymus to do that because in order to get a T cell that's only rearranged its beta chain but not its alpha chain, so no selection has ha acted on it yet, uh, you'd have to go into the thymus to get it. That's my answer. <laughs> yeah. And the last question, can CD8 positive cells can be activated without CD4 positive or independently can be activated in response to virus infected cells? No, they can't. They, uh, they, they, uh, there's a difference though. It, okay, so you've got a naive CD8 cell. It's never seen anything. And now it binds to a dendritic cell that's got CD28 and some other stuff on it because you need all three levels of signaling. You need, you need co-signaling, you, uh, you need IL-2 at the very least. Uh, cytokine, so you need signal one, signal two, and signal three to get a CD8 cell activated so it will differentiate into an effector, uh, an effector CD8 cell where it will home to the per periphery and kill whatever is infected. Once it is decided who it is and it is homing, it will, uh, now it's a differentiated CD8 cytotoxic T cell, and it's upregulated all its killing apparatus and everything. So it can then go, uh, and all it needs is, is the right peptide on class 1 MHC. That's all it needs to kill the cell. And why? Well, because you don't want to have a, you know, you want to just kill all the infected cells. So you don't want, you know, co stimulation or anything like that. Okay, so you just got to think about the initial dendritic cell getting that cytotoxic T cell going with all the signaling and everything. And the reason why you have all those layers of signaling is you don't want to just make a bunch of cytotoxic T cells that go out and kill everything because you're going to have a hell of an autoimmune disease. So that's why you want to have make sure that you're doing the right thing and then sending that puppy out there. Uh, to do the damage that's going to be very selective. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, that's it. That's all the questions and uh, all the fantastic content from Dr. Scott for today, at least. So in conclusion, yeah. I want to thank Dr. Scott so much for relating her insights into the organization of the immune system. Please do join us on June 15th for the next part. Uh, also at 11 o'clock Eastern time, the second part is the immune system in action. You do not want to miss that. Well, plus I'll finish, I'll finish this too. I'll finish okay. this too. I have a few more slides here, just a few. Okay. Uh, but the uh, agenda that hopefully you downloaded from the the um, tab in the viewer. Uh, so the same agenda that you don't downloaded for this webinar also includes the agenda for part two. Finally, 
thank you very much for joining the webinar today. An on-demand version will be available in a few days. As I mentioned before, I will chase you down and make sure you have the link. It will go by email to everyone who registered. I'll also send the link to the Q&A document when that is ready. So please do feel free to watch this or any of our on-demand webinars when it's convenient. Thanks again and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.